Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As many of us approach midlife, one of the things we certainly find ourselves dealing with is anxiety and depression. And more importantly, how we can do or what we can do to be able to take care of this in a way that doesn't have us taking drugs or taking injections. Trying to find a more natural approach to be able to deal with this. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is a very extraordinary doctor. We've had him on the program before. He has a wonderful book out called Brighton Baby. Now, people would be thinking, wait a minute, I thought we were talking midlife here and you're talking about babies. But if you get the opportunity to pick up this book, you'll find in its extraordinary pages wonderful ways that we can be dealing with a lot of approaches to a natural way of feeling better. After all, for some of us who want to conceive children, we want to be at our very physical best to be sure that our babies are going to be very much the same. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Dr. Roy Dittman. Roy, thank you for joining us here on the program. Hello. Great. It's great to be here again with you guys. Mm. Now, you know, like I said, uh, you know, Brighton Baby, people would think, well, you know, what's going on here? But when you really take a look at the nuts and bolts of what you write about, that's a very compelling read as well, you start to realize that a lot of information we get about health and nutrition seems to really be off the mark. Lots of sound bites and misinformation, so to speak. Tell us how this started for you. Well, for me, it it really began when I was very young, seeing children being born with birth defects, and uh, my own brother at the age of when I was when uh, when I was ten, and he was about eighteen months old, suddenly started getting seizures after having a vaccination, and this was uh, you know way back in the '60s, and our family didn't know what to do about it. My father's, you know, physicist, he was teaching physics at USC at that time and just starting to teach. And uh, it kind of devastated our family. We, we hadn't experienced or expected anything like that. And I, I, was, I became immediately curious about this subject and uh, started studying it even at that age and, and asking as many questions as I could. But what I found out from the medical establishment and, and, and many people is very little was known about it, and they just kind of um, surrendered to whatever their doctor said. I, I, uh, I, including me, I, I was, you know, totally a believer in uh, the conventional view of medicine in those days. Uh, but our family was very much involved in health. We owned health clubs, and and our family was very close with Jacqueline and. Gypsy Boots, a lot of early pioneers in raw food and fitness, uh, paradoxically. So I was exposed to this, uh, you know, one end of medic- medicine and science that was very high level. And uh, we had the best doctors that money could buy, so to speak, and, you know, the best health insurance and so forth. And, and at the other end of it were these kind of really uh, cutting-edge pioneers in, in health. And I started asking them questions, and they started telling me what they thought, you know, was healthy and what's healthy for children. And I became very curious, uh, more and more curious about what happened to my little brother, and uh, who is still institutionalized to this day, by the way. So it's it's something that really hit us hard, and I think uh, my father was devastated, and and it, it, it was something that we didn't know how to react to or what to do about in those days. But now today we know a lot more, and that's the good news. We know a whole lot more that we didn't know then. But talk about depression. I mean, it really drove, uh, you know, my parents into depression at that time. Um, I can only imagine what they went through. it, And I, I, I was very depressed for, uh, for a while afterwards, too. Mm-hmm. Well, I can imagine, you know, when you, as any parent that, uh, you know, my heart really goes out to parents who have children with afflictions that in, in cases could be lifetimes, you know, for a, an entire lifetime. And to realize, you know, how come those people over there get to have a healthy, happy kid who goes to school and does all the things that you would love your child to do, but this is what I have. And you can see how 
depression, you know, like, where did I go wrong? <laughs> you know, exactly. and, yeah. and the stages that you have to go through for something like that, and you know, and, and the best ways to deal with something like that. I actually have, there's a couple that lives down the street from us, and they have three boys, and one of them is on the autistic spectrum, and, and I know that your son was as well. And they said, you know, we just like him the way he is. Uh, he has a very unique perspective on the world. He doesn't really get out of the house much, but I guess he's just a really loving boy, which is slightly unusual from what I have experienced with the autistic spectrum. Usually they get crazy, you know. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> But, you know, they they have just kind of conceded, you know, this is who he is and this is how we want him to be, and, and that's the way it is. But you got to wonder sometimes deep inside, you know, don't they wish or is there a way that that can be reversed, you know, and mm-hmm. that there must be those mornings they wake up with a sense of depression like this is the way it is. Yeah, I I, I agree very much. Um, I I think that, you know, what we experienced as a family at that time was we were enamored and, and respectful of... Uh, authority figures who had gone through medical school. Mm-hmm. And uh, we often assume mistakenly that they study a lot of these issues associated with autism right. that are causal and correlative to autism spectrum disorders and, and other such um, birth defects like this uh, and, and the things that suppress genes and delete genes. And, of course, we know that now we were mistaken. Um, unless a doctor has been extensively trained in this very distinct area of medicine and medical science and even technologies and science, um, it, they, it's very doubtful they will know very much. Um, and it, if you look at medical curriculum today, um, it's getting a little bit better, but <laughs> only I mean, a little bit, huh? <laughs> you know, if you look at what doctors, I remember debating in high school, with um, this guy from, uh, he was kind of like the equivalent of Quack Watch. He, his his name was Victor Herbert. And uh, I remember debating him in high school about things like the simplest sugar and what kids should be eating uh, in the cafeterias. And he was, um, uh, in my debate against him in the 11th, when I was in 11th grade, you know, I looked up his background, and uh, he was sponsored by Coca-Cola and, you know, Skin <laughs> Sugar and, you know... Jeremy Might as well Mills. have been Red Bull, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so one of the things I brought up, you know, which kind of embarrassed him, he, did, he was surprised that a high school student would uh, actually confront him with these issues. But it was interesting that in those days, most people believed, including many in my family, that sugar was just another chemical in the universe and it was fine and it gave you a lot of energy. And so, you know, we've come a long way from there, from then. Mm-hmm. And um, now the same thing with issues like anxiety or depression. We used to think, okay, you have to go to a psychiatrist and, and, and get, you know, some session or do, you, you know, Freudian therapy mm-hmm. or something like this. And, you know, of course, as Woody Allen says, I've done 30, what, six years of uh, Freudian therapy and I don't know if I ever noticed much improvement. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it was Freudian therapy that caused depression and anxiety, <laughs> at least from the perspective of his nephew who uh, developed propaganda, for instance. <laughs> well, yeah, so if you look at those issues today, though, I mean, we know a lot more about what uh, we call depression, and uh, which is something I'm very interested in because in the area of perinatal medicine, uh, what I find with pregnant women, for instance, is that, that women get a lot more depleted of minerals and critical enzymes and, and many things during the pregnancy and during breastfeeding, I think far more than doctors ever assumed before. And consistently I've seen in my 30 years of specializing as a perinatal uh, you know, health expert, in this area, I've seen this consistently to be true, that when women get plenty of nutrients and build up their blood, build up their uh, reserve of probiotics and minerals, especially trace elements, and make themselves stronger during the pregnancy, 
as well as before and after that they don't they tend not to have postpartum depression or it's if they do it's very minimal mm-hmm. and you know if we look at what is the definition of depression like what is true depression like to to have a loved one die or a son or daughter die as a parent it's an, it's a, of course anyone will be depressed mm-hmm. or anybody there's real reasons to be depressed and there's just no way around it you're going to go through a grieving period and some may call that depression some may just call it grieving um but i look at it similar to like you know i used to be a heavy metal rock you know lead guitarist and lead singer in a band and i had a band here in orange county called the waves in in europe and i toured all over the world uh played in front of lots of people and i remember getting on stage one day and and I was like in front of 33,000 people. I've never pay, played in front of that many people before. And feeling just, you know, butterflies in your stomach, like, oh, my God, this is it. This is, I better do well, you know. And, um, and my friend said to me, he says, um, why don't you just look at it as excitement? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. You know, and as soon as he said that, I completely shifted my state from, you know, being anxious and scared and butterflies in the stomach to being, like, really excited, and I just, like, had the best performance I ever did. And so if we reframe some of our thinking about depression, and if people say, I'm depressed, I I like to tell them, I said, well, maybe you're not. Maybe you're not truly depressed. Can we reframe that to say, I have low energy today, or my thyroid feels like it's not functioning, or my adrenals are a little bit low, or... I don't think I had enough protein today or I need to go get some sunlight. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that we could say to ourselves which mm-hmm. don't reinforce that uh, label because then the label has a lot of meaning and then we make stories out of the meaning and then we ha- we're in a uh, kind of never-ending cycle of uh, uh, reinforcing um, state, right? reinforcing that state. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, too... Uh that you take a look as you may be watching television or you may come across an article in a magazine or read an ad. Boy, I'll tell you, Parade Magazine, that insert that goes in every Sunday newspaper, is notorious for this. You know, they give you this long litany story of something and when you begin to realize what it is, it's a big old long ad for a drug that they're encouraging you to take. I mean, it's usually a page to two pages. But Mm -hmm. you take a look at how depression, especially uh, between that and anxiety, are approached. It's sort of like they're saying, this is very unnatural for you to feel this way. Mm -hmm. And you get this feeling that you feel worse after watching this (laughs) through the messages than you really do. Then that increases your depression because now you realize, wait a minute, there is something very seriously wrong with me, which is a good reason to become even more depressed. So mm. maybe what they're offering here is going to make me feel the way that I should be feeling, when you already felt mm. fine the way it was to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know yeah. I had that. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out to me. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think the Germans did a study on these uh, SSRIs and the, these antidepressive drugs, so to speak. Um, and they found that having a beer with a friend was just as or more effective in many cases as taking the drug. Or having and, great uh, sex, hey, that'll lift you out of it real quick. <laughs> that'll do it. <laughs> you might be depressed when it's over with, but, you know, for some people that's what cigarettes are for, I guess. But <laughs> anyway. Exactly, yeah. It, it, it's, it, I'm glad you mentioned that because anything that will kind of change your state going for a walk, jumping in the uh, pool or the ocean, uh, the, you know, just uh, changing your state or your environment or what you're doing can often bring you out of it. Um, and, um, you know, I tell people also, look at the labels. Uh, the small print shows the side effects uh, on the drug before you take it. And then ask yourself the question, uh, is this worse than what I'm already experiencing? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you listen to the ads, for instance, uh, or as you watch the ads, you realize they're trying to take you away from one state, but all of a sudden these may induce all these other states that you didn't have to begin with. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, what what we know about drugs is they always damage or suppress liver and kidney function in almost every case. And the reason why is because they tend to be dehydrating, acidifying, and when when you take a, a substance that's an extract of an extract of an extract of various things we find in nature often, um, it's not occurring with the other synergistic cofactors um, uh, that, that nature has designed to allow it to be more therapeutic, actually. And once, you know, the Rockefellers started funding uh, these kinds of medical schools based upon drugs rather than natural substances, we found that a lot of these epidemics started increasing, in fact. Wow. Um, and a lot of diseases and, and problems um, increase because it was all based upon a synthetic, though science, so-called, quote-unquote, based medicine. The problem with, with the whole realm of what I call scientism and the whole cult around scientism is that it is uh, very myopic and limited. And it is, although it is based upon science, it's based upon very myopic, narrowly compartmentalized area of science that even by the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and, and other scientific groups, by their own admission, say, look, you know, this, you know, as much as 95% of this kind of university research is junk science. It's often, and I've directed research and funded it in three major uh, American universities uh, through um, my biopharma company. And I've seen that, you know, you see that again and again, uh, the research oftentimes is for somebody to get, a grad student to get their PhD or something like this. But um, in, in terms of what meaning it has for you and I, uh, you know, uh, in our daily lives, um, uh, you and me, I should say, is, uh, is very questionable. I, you know, I, I really struggle to find the, the actual relevance this kind of science has. And likewise, a lot of the research that's going on in universities is a um, kind of a, an escalator track for uh, lower paid uh, university professors to get high paid pharmaceutical jobs. So they know that if they're good boys and girls and they, and they give the right kind of research, then they can climb up the ladder and go up mm. the escalator to success and get paid more and so forth. So, this is the problem with, uh, now, pure science, there's nothing wrong with pure science. On the other hand, let's talk about that. Pure science is just study whatever you want, and it's not up to us. The government doesn't tell you what to do. A corporation doesn't tell you what to do. I, I'm in favor of that, as long as it's not so abstract that no one can even relate to it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's like, <laughs> We've seen plenty of that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that's what I call, you know, that's the realm of scientism. And a lot of the, if you look at the vaccination research, it's very, very myopic, actually. Mm -hmm. And they rarely ever do studies on, say, how these vaccines have effects long term on different, um, you know, organs and for generational uh, effects and how those vaccine, the vaccines and their adjuvants, what they add to the vaccine, like thimerosal, what kind of effect that has in the things that are already existing in our bodies, that are already existing as toxins, how these combine like binary and trinary chemical warfare in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And they never calculate that. They only calculate one thing at a time. And in a laboratory rat that's very controlled and sterile. So we're not anywhere near that. In fact, rats have so much more enzymes that, that protect them, you know, I think 100, 200 times more enzymes that protect them against pathogens than we do. So that's not even a real analogy. So when you look up close at a lot of this research, I, I, I'm, I'm saying be impressed with people who are smart, who are intelligent, who have university degrees, and always be skeptical and question them. Uh, read the studies that they print and find the flaws in it, because you will easily find the flaws in it. Um, basically, most research is you know, being able to read a graph and understand fancy terminology in one specialized area of, mm -hmm. of of interest, right? But what this all goes back to is, I'm saying, let's 
let's, let's put this all into perspective. What real meaning does this have for us? And, and you know, instead of uh, just bowing down to the cathedral of scientism, we should look at this from a completely holistic perspective. And that means we take everything into account. Um, and we can see that the system has failed us, has mm -hmm. failed our children right now. And one of the things when I debate doctors who are in favor of, you know, giving one-year-old children, uh, <laughs> you know, up to 36 vaccines, and um, amongst other things, and antibiotics and all kinds of things they include in their SOPs, is I say to them, or ask them the question, you know, if, you know where, where does this all end? Because right now, I mean, when I published my book, Brighton Baby, at the end of the last year, in 2012, it was one in 88 children um, that were uh, born autistic. And now uh, it's about one in 38. And that's just since, uh, you know, the first of the year, really. Uh -huh. So that's, that's a, we're in the hockey stick approach. And the latest research from Dr. Uh, Samsel and Dr. Sanef, uh, who we met, uh, I think you, you guys might have met them also at Autism One. Um, and I had the pleasure to meet her. She came to my lecture there. And she's an MIT researcher who's done an amazing paper researching glyphosate, Roundup. And she says that based upon that research alone, just on glyphosate, which is ending up in a lot of our food, um, and has been for longer than we thought, actually. I think it's been around for about 45 years, actually. And because that's been in our food, supply for so long. Now, it's more than one generation exposed. She's saying that one in two children will be born autistic, full-blown wow. autistic by 2025, just based upon that research alone. Now, when I, when I heard her say that, I was speechless, mm -hmm. uh, because it's not just to anybody saying that. And it's not just to anybody Monsanto can ignore, or officials at the CDC or NIH. And I wonder why, you know, there's 4 million autistic children in this country, why parents don't uh, just occupy the Senate offices and the congressional officers, you know, offices right now and say, we want answers because this is completely, we cannot tolerate this any longer. This is worse than a disaster. No because, and, 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 you know, the answers on the mainstream media and through these very arrogant, condescending scientists is, um, well, we, we may need another 20, 30 years to figure this out because it looks like it's your genes. I mean, I've actually had them say that to me. And I just want to really punch them out. I tell you, this, there's nothing makes me angrier than when people are like that arrogant and in your face about this stuff. And I say to them, look, uh, we, we don't have time, first of all. That's not going to happen. And I, I think that if you wait for that long, I think you're going to see a, a violent revolution in this country, like we heard what we saw at some of these autism conferences now. You mm -hmm. see parents, you see congressmen and women standing up and saying, this is, this is a, probably the worst challenge we're facing as a nation. And... Um, I tell people, look, this is the soft underbelly of a national crisis. And, and people, you know, they don't want to hear bad news. No one does. I don't want to be the bringer of bad news. But I say, I don't know how to avoid this. Right. Because I feel like I'm somebody who's watching a train. There's, there's, a, there's a bus on the railroad tracks, and a train is coming at 110 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. It's going to hit the bus. And I, I hate to bring bad news, but it, it's going to be worse if it hits. And that's, what we're, that's where we're really at right now. And I, I feel that because, you know, people like yourself and your wife and our friends, we're more aware of what's happening. We're in the business of studying this. We're in the, you know, we're in the know. We're, we're reading studies. We're reading, uh, you know, news releases all the time. And, and we know the people who are on the cutting edge of what's happening today. And they're all saying the same thing. They're saying, you know, we don't have time. We, we can't wait any longer. This is getting, 
to the point where it will cause a collapse of our of our economy and our country, like uh, RFK Jr.'s speech uh, at Autism One, where he said, "Who's going to pay? This is going to cost at least two trillion dollars." Um, and that was a few years ago. To to fix and and heal those four million children who have autism, and and does the government have a plan for that? Is there any liability that pharmaceutical companies will have? Mm-hmm. Apparently not. They've been indemnified. Now you have to ask the question: Why would they be indemnified if there's no problem? I mean, why would they ask for indemnification legally from the federal government when their their vaccines are totally safe, right? The Marisol right. safe, right? Right. And <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> you know, they're safe, but just in case. <laughs> exactly. So that's a little bit suspicious for me. Um, and, you know, but see, you know, this all goes back to our, our state of mental health. Because, uh, you know, if somebody has an autistic child, it is a depressing thing. And I can understand why so many parents have been depressed. I've been there. It's very sad to see your own son can't catch a ball or, or can't do certain things. And you know that at that stage of life, he should be able to. And so my heart goes out to the parents, and I know what they go through, because I've been through it myself, mm-hmm. sleepless nights and worrying and blaming myself and thinking what I went, did wrong and how to correct it. And, you know, I came out the other side. I'm very fortunate to have, have been helped by so many brilliant doctors and scientists from all over the world. And um, and I'm very grateful for that, that great positive outcome for my son. And I want to also, that's why I wrote Brighton Baby, so that people can be forewarned. And I tell them, look, you don't take chances with your family. Don't, don't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. If, if, if a doctor says they have this all handled, you know, ask them more questions and say, no, thank you. Because, you know, if it's all handled, then why are the statistics going up so dramatically um, every three months? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, for me, I, I, I'm, I'm working with a holistic pediatrician now and who's very much uh, aware of these things. Uh, uh, and I, I say to parents, I say, you know, this is the time in our country's history where we really have to take responsibility for our families. Mm-hmm. And, and please don't be a victim because there's no power in being a victim. Mm-hmm. Um, and... And, uh, and when you take responsibility for your own health and for your family's health, it's very empowering and it's very, it's very um, encouraging and it, it really lights you up uh, to be proactive like that. And I see dads and moms, as soon as they become responsible, they, cut, they just say, you know what, I'm taking responsibility for everything in my life. I'm not going to blame anyone else. I'm saying I'm responsible. Buck stops here. I'm going to make sure everything goes into my mouth. And my wife's mouth is completely, I'm aware of, and if it's going to cause harm or not. And I say, well, no, that's, that's exactly right. That's what we have to do. And we need to grow up and be responsible. It's really interesting that you put it that way, too, because you're right. You know, it is about personal responsibility. It's easy that you can point your finger and say, well, you know, I was doing what they told me to do, as if you didn't do it, you would somehow end up in prison or be maybe in front of a firing squad, but I started doing even the same thing for my dog, you know. Mm. Sure, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of great natural pet products out there, but I honestly, besides what's on the label, don't know how much of those things are in there and and so Mm. forth. So I started feeding my dog just a couple of weeks ago. I started doing this, just natural ingredients, stuff that Mm. I would eat, you know, and Mm. To watch this dog go from what he was was kind of, you know, somewhat playful, and but more or less listless and in a fog. Now he's springy. He seems sharp. He seems like he's really there, you know, I mean, just in that mm. moment. And, you know, and and again, going back to what you were talking about, about these professionals, you know, and I had a veterinarian saying, well, you know, with the natural dog foods or the foods that are produced out there, you know, they're made with the balance of all the nutrients that, you know, your dog needs, and they may not be getting it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. But my wife was saying, you know, just the other day she was listening to the radio, and they came on and they were talking about uh, pet foods. 
And she says, I was amazed that you were doing all the things they were suggesting. And I did it just on pure instinct. For instance, he gets, you know, a teaspoon of sea kelp with his meal. Mm. Granulated sea kelp. He also gets a half a teaspoon of spirulina blue-green algae. Mm. Now, along with that, you know, I feed him a portion of baked sweet potato or yam. That's sort of like the grain, if you will, or rice, one of those two. And then usually an organ meat, you know, from a chicken or something like that that I just lightly cook. I don't cook it all the way. And then the broth from that actually adds to the taste, and so it's an all-natural product. Now, you can't tell me that just with the kelp and the spirulina alone that this dog is not getting all of the nutrition that it needs that far surpasses anything you would get from a baked, roasted dog food that's in a bag sitting on a shelf for who knows how long. You know, and but the point with what I'm saying is mm. that here a veterinarian who's supposed mm-hmm. to be an expert about animals is trying to say you really need to be careful with that, but I'm looking at my dog's health, the end result, and going, this dog has never looked healthier. I must be doing something right. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but the fact that we would surrender and realize that, as you just said, or have been saying, that when an expert tells you, well, then what I'm doing must not be right, so maybe I should do that, which is what led to the problem in the first place. Does Mm. that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I'm glad you brought up your dog. You you have a very unfortunate dog to have you as a a friend. Well, you know, I used to practice with a holistic veterinarian in Los Angeles for about Mm -hmm. three and a half years, and I learned a lot um, just studying with him and, you know, they they have very different training than medical doctors. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, it's much better because they have to study a lot of different kinds of physiologies and details. And I think they know more about human health than a lot of doctors, actually. Because <laughs> they, they I really, wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> well, like you just said. There's you know, more of a demand on those doctors to be sure their pets come out the other side better than they came in. <laughs> exactly. They, they have a different motive. And, uh, well, you know, that's a very good point, is that, is that when you feed these animals uh, what's really healthy for them, uh, that's like an amazing uh, meal you described. Um, mm-hmm. and, you well, know, he tries to eat fun. his bowl when he's finished, <laughs> so something <laughs> must be working. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's, you know, that, that's a great example because I've seen that too with the uh, when you feed the animals these kinds of food, and it's kind of like Pottinger's cats and what rest, Weston Price's research around, you know, what kind of foods are healthy for teeth and bones and growing children and human beings as well. The very similar um, research that was done, and, and and that's a great example. Is is for I- any family can do that actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, is uh, is start feeding your cats and dogs and your pets. Uh, really healthy meals and experimenting with different things and watch them. I mean, even, even my kids, they did experiment with, um, with the, the fish, you know, and I uh, let them do it like with goldfish and all that. And, and they fed them this, um, these pellets that had MSG in them. Oh, and boy. it was like, you know, the fish bloated up. It was like, <laughs> whoa, look at, they got fat. They got bloated. And, uh, and then we stopped feeding them the pellets and they shrunk back down again. And uh, it was interesting, the same thing happened with the Russians who did the research um, on IMSG. Uh, Very similar uh, thing happened with rats. They developed tumors and they got very bloated. And, and, you know, you can see these kinds of things. People can do their own simple science experiments. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, what makes a scientist? It's asking a question. That's science. Every time you ask a question... You're a scientist. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, there you go. <laughs> because uh, it's just like, you know, the Senate is really worried about journalists giving bad publicity about the government and the federal government right now. So they're trying to kind of redefine what a journalist. You have to go through this kind of a training. You have to go through our system. You have to get certified and all that. Then you're official, and then you can report in the mainstream media just what we want you to say. We don't mm-hmm. want any rogue journalists going out there doing exposés anymore. So uh, you have to qualify you have to be you know, tell us where if you qualify to be a journalist, quote unquote. That's what they're approving that right now in the Senate as we speak. 
And I say, I go back to, you know, I say, well, what about freedom of speech, you know? I think anybody who has half a brain and a, a pen, pencil, or typewriter, or computer, and can take good pictures, uh, is a journalist, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we need more people who have some kind of other perspective on life. Otherwise, we never figure things like, like the autism epidemic out. Mm -hmm. It's people who were, you know, so-called rogue scientists, doctors, uh, parents who said, you know, by God, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to make sure I find out what causes to my son or daughter. And, and that's the kind of people we need. Those are the people that have the American spirit and that I grew up with. My grandfather, you know, was a, pilot, a very famous pilot and became an astronaut. He was just a, you know, a bootstrap type of guy who, who just got in an airplane and started flying it one day, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of people we need. Uh, people who just say, I'm going to figure this out, and American ingenuity and creativity does usually. And uh, I think that being Americans, I think we are figuring out what's causing autism, and I think pretty much we haven't figured out everything. But I don't know about you, but I think we figured out most of it, uh, what causes and correlates to autism spectrum disorders, and is if we know, and if we know that, then we know what to do about it. Well, you know, and the other thing too is it's much like a really good comedian. A really good comedian isn't just a guy or a girl that's up on stage that makes you laugh. A really good comedian is someone who makes you laugh and makes you feel uncomfortable about why you're laughing at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. It isn't these sellouts that you see doing sitcoms. These are the guys that you squirm in your chair going, okay, I think that person over there is laughing. That was kind of funny, but I feel uneasy about it. What is Because they're social critics. That's what they do. Mm. <clears throat> With journalism, you know, what is the definition of journalism? Well, a journal you, is what you write things down that occur. You know, there isn't, you know, if a congressman trips and falls and busts his face on the pavement and you journal that, well, sure, they want to convert it into something else. Well, I slipped on a banana peel, and so I'm suing, you know, and the fact is, well, maybe you had too many martinis. That's what I journaled, you know. But <laughs> I, I see, But the fact is, you know, and, and going back to what we were originally talking about with depression and anxiety, you see mm -hmm. this so prevalent today in such a way that we're not supposed to have these things when, in fact, they're very natural occurrences. But I think that it's been so slung far to the left or the right, or whichever direction that you want to consider, that we find these to be unnatural states. So mm -hmm. getting to that, let's talk about these as natural states and how they've mm -hmm. become unnatural, so to speak. Well, yes. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm from California. I'm about as California as, it, California as it gets back, going all the way back in California history. Uh, and uh, being part Chumash Indian, going back even prior to the you know, the Western uh, uh, cooperation and, and so forth. Uh, what, we're, what we're looking at in California is, is a culture that's based upon health from the very beginning because in the beginning of California's early history, people came here to um, experience uh, year-round sunlight, so they got more vitamin D levels going in the ocean. There's a culture around surfing um, and also to, to eating a lot more citrus, which is vitamin C. And in that culture, we see that the rest of the country saw super strong children being raised in California. Mm -hmm. And they started saying, well, we want the oranges. So we started ex exporting and transporting oranges to the rest of the country and our culture. So if you look at it, we're very fortunate to have governors. All of our governors, um, whether Republican or Democrat, always are very pro-health. And around, so we tend to have less depression, I believe, because of the sunlight and because of our healthy culture. Now, with that said, let's define what we really mean, again, by depression. Because I think most of it is low energy, low thyroid, low adrenals, um, uh, depletion of, of trace elements and minerals, um, not enough probiotics, um, not enough exercise and circulation. Um, you know, when, when you handle all those things, I, I ask people, I say, 
well, let's wait. Let's not label yourself anyway. Let's just, just describe to me what you're experiencing right now, and don't make a lot of meaning about that. And let's uh, approach this metho methodically, and let's shore up all of these factors which I just mentioned. And you know, usually when people do all of these things and they fall through on it, they come back and they say, well, I, don't, you know, I didn't even think about it anymore. It didn't even occur to me that <laughs> I had said that. Did I say that at one point? And I said, yeah. That's how, why you originally came in. Do you remember that? And they said, oh, yeah. No, I don't, oh, I don't, I don't even feel close to that anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I see again and then again and again. So well, a lot of times what people think is a, a serotonin you know, reuptake inhibitor type of a problem, uh, I say, well, uh, do you have evidence that you have serotonin reuptake inhibition problem? You know, where's the evidence? <laughs> so, because, you know, you seem pretty healthy to me, and you seem pretty lit up and happy, and seem like you love your wife, and you seem like you've got a lot going for you. I don't see any, you know, brand label, you know, name like depression. I can't, I can't, I could pin on you. I, I said, you know, you seem a lot happier than most people I know. So, uh, you know, and they, they agree. They say, yeah, I don't, I don't feel anything anymore. So, you know, these people have plenty of energy. So I tell them simple things like start meditating, make sure you get enough rest. You know, like you're saying, having really great sensual intimacy and expressing love between one another. That helps. Doing the, what I call the, the 10 to 15 or more free things in life, walking along the beach, spending time with your kids, you know, enjoying your life, living a balanced life, meditation, prayer, uh, enjoying and being grateful for all of your friends and spending time with the, your people in your family that sometimes you, you wish you could. You know, just take it off and do it anyway, even if you feel like you don't have the time. And, and people find that they're no longer depressed when they do these things. And, I, and we put all this emphasis on drugs and artificial stimulants and, and so forth. Um, and I, what I find is just the opposite, is that the free things are a lot more powerful, actually, and effective, actually. Mm -hmm. They have a very powerful uh, drug-like effect on our brain and our physiology. And you know what I also find? We're finding, and I was just going to a lecture with a, a famous you know, doctor for NASA and for the Russian space program and for special forces, a really brilliant doctor, geneticist, and she was. We were just saying, "Wow, we 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 agree so much on so much of the the research about this subject. We we're talking about depression and mental states, and we find that when people are so-called depressed, they have like an in, insufficient hypothalamic function, primarily in their brain. And it's fairly simple to bring that up, and also pituitary and pineal axis." is uh, suppressed. And, and then the nervous system, um, which controls that to the brain, uh, all of our endocrine functions and hormones, when, when you get the energy up, when you bring the energy up in that part of the central brain, um, that controls all the other hormones, and including the thyroid. Mm -hmm. and, and once you bring all those hormonal distinctions up and energy levels up, people are not only not to depressed anymore, but they become highly creative and intelligent and, and curious about life. And I said, you know, why don't you, you know, if someone says that I'm truly depressed, one of the first things I like to do with them is take them back to their mother's womb and then take them also back to when they were a child, when they were really the happiest they've ever been. It doesn't matter when, you know, where were you, it doesn't matter. Everyone has a story around this. And even people can do this right now who are listening to this call. They say, you know, go back to when you remember you were happiest in your whole life. It may not be one time, maybe even more than one time. And remember that. And now feel everything you were feeling. See everything you saw at that time. And, and, and listen to the sounds that were around you at that time. And re-experience the happiness you felt in every cell in your body. Now, right now, you're experiencing the exact same thing. And I said, you know, in any moment we can choose to be happy. But happiness can't be dependent upon outside reasons or justifications or excuses. Mm -hmm. It has to only be for no reason 
whatsoever. <laughs> you have to be really crazy in this area and say, you know, what, whatever, I, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, it's an, and, and we see that children don't need an excuse. Look at your children or your grandchildren. Look how happy they are just with very simple things, you know, looking at a flower or, wow, look at that lizard. Or, let's go see the dolphins today, Grandpa. Or, you know, whatever it is, they're not, they don't need an excuse to be happy. Mm-hmm. They're already happy. And, you know, when I see my children's happiness, it helps me to recognize how I was a happy child, you know. And I think that that's, those simple kinds of exercise are are some of the most powerful ones I know of because um, it's really simple. As soon as you make a reason to be happy, that, as soon as that reason goes away, then that, takes, that goes, takes your happiness with it. So I tell people, be completely unreasonable and be happy anyway for no reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Do things out of the ordinary. It's as you were describing before about these extraordinary people it reminded me of uh, when Stephen Jobs was with Apple Computer when he was rehired or re-brought back in, whatever the case is, and they developed this outstanding commercial uh, that was narrated by Richard Dreyfus, and basically it summarizes up the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that usually do. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta be nuts to live in this world. That's what makes makes it so exciting. <laughs> but fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Now, tell us, uh, yeah. Doctor Dittman, how people can find out more about Brighton Baby, and uh, do you have a website they can go to? Yes, you can go to Brighton Baby, spelled with a like Brighton O N, Brighton Baby, like Brighton Beach, England, BrightonBaby dot com, and. Uh, and there, we have some things up there as well. And we're developing more and more content all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm co-writing a, a, a book uh, on rapid recovery after surgery right now. It should be finished in a, in a few months. Um, and it's uh, very thorough on, on how to recover quickly after surgery, very practical, very unique information. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then also completing my second book, um, on pregnancy and birth um, on, in the Brighton Baby series. And um, we are always available for um, uh, appearances and uh, trainings. We're starting uh, to complete our doctor training program as well. Uh, we're doing collaboration now with uh, uh, very significant countries, uh, ministers of health and hospitals as well to um, use as training facilities for doctors in residency who want perinatal specialization as well. Very good. Always a pleasure to have you on the program because as we always continually try to convey to our listeners, question authority. You know, these people are no smarter than you are. You know, you can figure things out for yourself and you can certainly find what the right answers are just by simply experiencing the results that you're looking for. Yes, I couldn't agree more, my friend. It's, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, you understand these things because uh, you as a father and a husband and a man, uh, it's important for us to communicate uh, mm-hmm. these, these really important messages to other men and fathers. And, uh, and, and it, this is the kind of uh, you know, sharing that makes a difference in people's lives. So I really appreciate your program. Very much. We, we love having you on, and I'm sure we'll have you back again as those new books come out. We definitely encourage our listeners out there to find out more. Give out your website one more time. Yes, it's uh, brightonbaby.com. Brighton with an O, that's brightonbaby.com. You can find out more. Dr. Dittman, thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. You too. We want to thank you, the listeners, for finding out more about this. You can visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do have a free weekly e-news update for you to sign up for as well. We thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway.